And I'm incredibly nervous because I spent many fretful nights wondering how I could rise to the challenge of transparency, global recession, war, plastic pollution, the problem seemed so incredibly daunting. So in the dark of night, I did what any reasonable person might do. I began my Google search. <laughs> I thought, you know, there's got to be a joke in here somewhere. There's got to be. To bring a little light and levity to this very difficult situation. So Google jokes transparency. As you might imagine, there are none. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe plastics and transparency. It's got to be, got to be something there. Well, to my amazing delight and surprise, I found this joke. Now, I'm not typically a joke teller, so you have to, have to bear with me. A guy walks into a psychiatrist's office wearing nothing but a plastic dry cleaner bag. The doctor looks up across his desk and says, I can clearly see your nuts. <laughs> so there you have it. I got transparency and plastic all in the same, all in the same thing. So transparency and plastic is an abiding theme in my life and in the life of mine and my husband's Richard Lang. We were married several years ago, much later in life. And because I wanted this love to last, I thought, what better thing than to make my wedding ensemble entirely out of plastic, because plastic, like diamonds, are forever. So I made my wedding dress, knitting those plastic dry cleaner bags. The, the wrap, the shawl, was several hundred of those bags that I cut into strips, and I knitted, and tying the ends so it made a very fluffy, effervescent shawl. For around my head, I took white plastic bags, and I tucked and folded red plastic bag to make little roses. The skirt was bundled, gathered, white plastic shopping bags. So that everything that you're seeing in this dress was made. The entire uh, outfit was uh, recycled materials. We had our first date in 1999 on Kehoe Beach in the Point Reyes National Seashore. It's a remote beach uh, just north of San Francisco, and um, not a place that, tra that would be necessarily trashed by picnickers or ne'er-do-wells leaving the debris behind. We discovered on that first date, to our amazement, that we each, each of us, three years prior to that date, had been picking up plastic and making art out of it. We could not imagine our good fortune at meeting somebody else picking, that liked to pick up plastic and make art. But we did, and we forged quite a dynamic uh, collaborative relationship. The cincher, however, was the Valentine's Day after we first met. Richard created a heart, a beautiful heart, made just from the red plastic that he had collected from the beach. Many of you, how many of you have ever heard of the uh, North Pacific Gyre, the Great Garbage Patch? It's described uh, by some as an island the size of Texas or maybe the size of Brazil. At any rate, it's an enormous quantity of plastic. To say it's an island is not exactly uh, a, a correct description. It's more like a soup. It, uh, it's not a, it, we can't exactly see it from Google Earth, but it's actually more detrimental than that because the pieces of plastic have become so small and so degraded that it's more like a stew of polymer chains that can actually never quite be cleaned up. And, it, and because of that, it's somewhat invisible to us. What's visible, however, is the plastic that's washing up seasonally on our, own, on our very own Kehoe Beach. There is a we call it our plastic season. It's just, we're just about to hit our uh, season opener. It usually goes from mid-November till March. 
And um, I know it, it's kind of funny that way, but it's a combination of the storms and the current that brings the plastic in. And it brings it in from all over the Pacific Rim. It brings it from that gyre and brings it washing up. And as you can see here in this photograph, it's quite a confetti strew of pieces. It's all entangled in the seaweed. And the thought of really being able, the possibility of really cleaning it up is not really, um, really a possibility. So we have taken upon ourselves to um, tend to be the planetary housekeepers for not just Kehoe Beach, but only 1,000 yards of this one beach. Because we realized if we narrowed our focus, if we just had two people on 1,000 yards of beach, we tried to, uh, we thought that, that that could give us even a more powerful message because then by extrapolation, if we look at all the beaches over the entire planet, people will say, hey, maybe something is really going on if this much plastic is washing in on this one beach. And it is, it's all entangled in the seaweed and the kelp. It's a big mess. But we have fun, and we're quite competitive in our collecting. We'll uh, rally up big, uh, big drafts of the stuff and pull it back. Uh, if there's enough, we'll find some rope and make a trailer of it. And in this competition, while we're collecting, we'll secret away into our pockets the very special items. And then at the end of the day at dinner, we'll display our hand and say, hmm, look what I found. Hmm, look what I found. Because it's only out of this game playing can we actually make light out of a really desperate and terrible situation. But we do. We have a good time. We bring all the plastic home. We don't think of it as necessarily being dirty, but it is sandy. So we take it and we wash it off, and we lay it out to dry. Sun-dried plastic is the best. And here's Richard looking over a day's haul. Uh, typically, on, in, during the high season, we can manage about 75 pounds to bring back, and that's after a couple of hours of collecting. And if any, we have an open invitation to any of you who would like to join us at Kehoe Beach during the winter time. We will give you our information, and please come. It's a, it's a grand adventure, and who knows, you might actually find something that will be part of our treasured collection. So at any rate, one of the things that we enjoy most about what we do is sorting the plastic. So the first thing is according to color and kind color being the most obvious uh, demarcation. So we have boxes and boxes of the stuff. We figure we've collected over the years a couple of tons of plastic. And this is in our barn. Fortunately, we have a barn, so we can uh, store, house our inventory. So we're always at the ready. We get called upon to do an artwork or an installation. We can pull out the shoes or the balls or whatever, and we're, we're ready to go, or the turquoise or the pastel colors. So sorting is a very satisfying, uh, almost meditation on it. And what that means is that every piece of plastic that we have picked up from the beach, we've picked up once, and then we've touched again and put it into our various boxes. Because sorting and categories are one of the main strategies that we use to uh, represent what we do, we have great fun finding these categories. As I said, the first thing is color. It's the most evocative. And people always ask us, well, did you do something to the color? No, this is exactly how it comes. So when we found the first red rectangle, we thought, mm, what, is, what is that? It wasn't anything that either of us could recognize. And then we found three, and then five. And so it begins to break out of the mass of red, and it becomes something. And we really didn't know what these little red cheese spreaders were. But then we asked Richard's daughter, and she said, you guys, it's sort of like this thing we're talking about, the young people and being computer savvy. She said, don't you know, those are the handy packed cheese spreaders. Those little, you know, the little containers, they have crackers on one side and the cheese on the other. And for just that moment, you dip into the cheese. And we know that these were not left by picnickers on the beach because you can see when you show an arrangement of things that are of similar kind, you can begin to discern the differences. And that's one of the things that we also enjoy, to display all of these 
cheese spreaders, but you see some of them have been bleached white. That means they've been at sea for a long time. There's ones with oil splotches on them. There are some that are actually even growing bryozoans that have been at sea so long. These are something that we find every time we go to the beach. Uh, we don't know anyone that smokes them, but these are the little tips from Tipperillo, the little cig cigarillo uh, smokes. And we know that each one of these has a story to tell. You can see some of them are very gnarly, like some probably fisher person was out kind of walking the plank, worrying the end of that uh, cigar tip. Uh, again, some of these are stained and evidence of a long time at sea. And then there's the lemon. We love the lemon squeezers. Those are a real prized, real prized thing, as my grandmother always used to say, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And then the disposable, as in disposable lighters. You know, this was a thing where uh, you, it brings to the question, well, where is a way? Let's just throw that away. And where is a way? Well, a way is actually ending right back up on Kehoe Beach, as in this array of disposable lighters. We call that series of arrangements our known quantity, and we display them as if they're drawers in a natural history museum, as if they're specimens from our consumer culture, all laid out like birds or spiders. And um, this is a display that we had at Stanford a couple of years ago. And I'm going to talk about the little uh, ensemble in front here in a minute. This is a piece that we call Home Again, Home Again. We are so surrounded and uh, inundated by plastic. It's so washed into our lives in so many unexpected ways that we found a chair missing one leg. And then we found the leg, a different leg from a different chair. We put it together, and we created this ensemble, all covered mosaic-like, uh, to represent this home again, home again idea. And then we set these things, these objects that we've made, into various uh, art galleries and museum spaces. This was a holiday festival show. So you can see we made a trash mystery. And then we have a, a set of uh, wreaths there of cutlery and combs and, and lighters. We did a whole series of uh, festive wreaths because plastic is the gift that continues, keeps on giving. We called that show Eternal Presence. We see on a lot of the uh, items that we find uh, this uh, strange glyph, this, this, these regular lines. And we're imagining sometime in the distant future that maybe an archaeologist sometime will look at that and they'll say, hmm, who were these people? So many of their objects had this motif on them. What did, what did that say about them? And we imagine that, they, they, that these future people will say, well, maybe that was a, a religious code of some kind, that, it was, uh, that they, they, uh, they bowed down to it, they honored it in some way. So we built a giant barcode out of various items, so with uh, beach floats, oyster spacer tubes, tipperillo tips, combs, all of these lined up to represent uh, how people may come to think of us in the future. It is, in some sense, our present day God. We had the opportunity this last year to present some work in the windows at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in their garage, street side. Uh, scientists estimate, estimate that there are about 46,000 pieces of beach plastic, visible plastic, floating in every square mile of every ocean. Multiply that out, and we're talking trillions of bajillions of pieces of plastic. The numbers are so huge that it's very difficult for any of us to even get our minds around them. So we thought that it might be helpful to ourselves and to others to begin to count out a representative sample. So we thought in this piece that we called a block party that we would count up 4,600 pieces as a representative sample. But we knew that it was something far too much that, that it would be very difficult for us to accomplish. 
So we, um, here's a, a detail of that hanging sample. And you can see all the jolly, wonderful things. And this was hanging, and it was as if it was shimmering and floating in the window to represent that, feel, that kind of oceanic feeling. As I said, we knew that this was a task far beyond our ability to accomplish. So we were able to join forces with the Larkin Street Youth Services Program in San Francisco. It's a special program for homeless and at-risk youth. And I had no idea how they might take to this. Here we were, these older people coming in with bins of plastic and saying, hey, gang, let's see, maybe we can string this stuff up and make this art piece. It was astonishing how well they took to this project. We sat around at big tables as if we were uh, at a quilting bee, and the conversation ran to what is this stuff? What is plastic in our lives, and what does it really mean? And they were able to help us complete this project with great pride and exhilaration. We actually ended up taking them to Kehoe Beach, Many of them had never been to a wild place before. They helped collect the plastic and ended up making some of their very own artworks out of what they found there. There was a tremendous sense of pride. They could walk by these windows. The windows, because they're street side, are open 24-7, so they could invite friends and family to go. With all of our public artwork projects, we want people that help us to be able to point to that artwork and say, I made this. And that was one of the most um, validating and affirming things for these youth with this project. We like to have our work displayed in non-traditional venues where a person who wakes up in the morning and didn't even know they wanted to see art, didn't even think about it, may stumble by it. They may be walking past these windows and, and take a double take and look at it and go, hmm, what is that? To evoke a kind of curiosity and mystery, to find art in really unexpected places. And there's nothing better than seeing one's art on the back of the bus. <laughs> and we were the, the, we were the poster artists for the Coastal Cleanup Day uh, two years ago. And thrilling to be stuck in traffic and to see your art there. <laughs> nothing much better than that. We were recently... And then this is a series that we did for the SFMOMA Museum Cafe. We created a series of plates. We were struck by the color of fiesta ware plates, you know, these brilliant pottery colors. And again, people think, oh, the plastic is so, uh, the colors are so great. So we put together a series, finding the color so we were, we were thinking here, just really, what we want uh, to happen when people look at our work, we want them to be engaged first with beauty, because we're artists, beauty first is our motto. And then upon closer inspection, to get our, uh, the underlying environmental message. So we did a contrast and compare with these, with these plates. We work also photographically. Much of the work we do is with printmaking. Uh, Richard has a business called Electric Works in San Francisco. It's a photographic studio where you and any artists that you know can come to realize your biggest visions. We love to help people take from a small germ of an idea and make it uh, really big and really magnificent. So here's Richard arranging the plastic on the light table. The camera body is just above that, and so we can argue and fight about the perfect arrangement, and then we get immediate feedback in the computer. Part of what we've learned in our many years now collaboration is there is a lot of fighting and going back and forth. We'll say, oh, that just needs, one of us will say, oh, that just needs one more little enhance of green or blue, uh, and round and round it goes. We sign both of our names to all of our work in plastic, so we both have to agree that it's what we agree to. We were commissioned recently to do a series of work for Cavallo Point Lodge. It's an eco-friendly conference center and beautiful hotel in a group of rehabilitated military housing. And we were commissioned to do not artwork to go over the couch, 
but artwork to go over the commode. And um, we thought, wow, what, a, what better place there might be to have our artwork. Most art, maybe most artists wouldn't say that, but for us, we were, we were happy about that. So we created a series of really uh, beautiful lyrical pieces uh, with playful toys, bright colors. This one's called Smoked Salmon. Each one had a great title. Bosquidel. We did 22 different designs as I say, commissioned to go right over the toilet. We do, as I say, a lot of stoop labor. We call it our stoop yoga, bending over, picking up, bending over, picking up every single piece. But Richard had suffered a little bit of a back ache and injury, so it was not possible for him to do that bending over. So he decided, let's take a little section of the beach and see what it would mean to really clean it up. Is that possible? Because you could see we're picking up kind of the biggie, chunky pieces, the things that are brilliant and enticing. But what would it mean to really clean up the beach? And we discovered the tiniest little BB-sized pellets of plastic just the side. That's a finger there. So it's a tiny piece of plastic. And Again, using the internet, we went home and we discovered that these little plastic pellets are called nurdles, or mermaid's tears. They're pre-production plastic, and it's the way that plastic is shipped all over the planet. Uh, it is the dashboard on your car to the shampoo bottle. It's in its raw form, and it goes and then is shaped and formed in the factory. Because there have not been very stringent uh, regulations on how this stuff is transported, it's gotten loose on the planet, and they are everywhere coming up on the beaches. What's really unfortunate about them is that they're tiny and often mistaken for fish eggs. So the little fish eats the big fish and the big fish, and so it goes on up the food chain. And they also, because they haven't been made into anything yet, they're very open in their structure, and they absorb toxins in the ocean. There's a, a Dr. Hashigi Takada in Tokyo University. If you send him a sample of your very own nurdles, he can do an analysis for you. You can see our San Francisco nurdles, although DDT has been banned for many years. Um, our, our, our personal nurdles have DDT in them as well as other uh, toxic sub substances. Uh, you can go to our website beachplastic.com and see the full slate of images uh, from Hashigi and with the various analysis of the PCBs and other things that are found in our nurdles. And then here's an artwork that we did about those nurdles. This is our uh, own very bowl of soup. It's called What's for Supper? Uh-huh, unfortunately. Some of you may have noted the jewelry. I'm always wearing some little um, item because I feel like that's a great way to engage people in conversation. As I said, beauty is a way, and wearing some kind of fashion statement is a way that I've found to open the conversation about what's going on about plastic and the invisible way it has come into our lives. I lived my uh, whole life almost with just a cardboard milk carton with the kind that you just pull open and you pour the milk, no problem. I really didn't, didn't see that that was necessarily a liability. But someone along the way most recently has added a new improvement, which is a uh, screw cap with a pull tab. And we now have these little bits of white plastic that have entered the garbage stream. Uh, they're not necessarily recyclable, and it makes the cardboard cartons even less so. So they are a tremendous detriment, and it's a piece of plastic that's almost invisible to us and completely unnecessary in our lives, at least for mine. Because I'm always wearing one of these, we had the great fortune a couple of years ago to uh, visit Africa and to go on a safari. And I was wearing one of these when we visited a, a Maasai tribe. 
and the elder woman from that tribe came rushing over to me. She was touching my arm and grabbing my arm and, and uh, wanting to know what this thing was on my wrist. And I said, oh, it's from milk cartons. Now remember that the Maasai uh, subsist on blood and milk and probably don't know what a milk carton is. But at any rate, I'm having my guide explain to her milk carton, you know, plastic milk carton. And while I'm giving it to her, all of the other women in the village are rushing over to examine it. I then bought one of her beautiful beaded bracelets. They are very, uh, she's a very fine craftsperson. And it was through art, it was through this wonderful interchange beyond words, beyond ability to necessarily understand one another, there was this magical moment between us. And I always think that every time that I'm telling this story, that she's there going, oh, there was this white woman that came into our village and is try trying to tell us about plastic. Plastic has come into our lives. This is another projection into the future. We imagine how uh, the geologist will, will discover this layer, this plasticine discontinuity embedded within the geological strata. And this will best represent our time and our era. So where do we go from here? What do we do? We're just two people who have found one little beach and what does love have to do with it? You know, Tina Turner, she posed that question. It wasn't a Zen koan. It was about Ike and a lot of other stuff going on. But I found an answer that works for me. Love has everything to do with it. It has to do with a person. It has to do with a place. And it has to do with a planet. And I would sure wish to hell, hope to hell that this place wouldn't go to hell in a plastic dry cleaner bag. Thank you. <laughs>